first two short documentaries you'll see today are, uh, the first is called Skull and Bone, and it's by our alumna Victoria Rivera, and the second is called Holly, and that's by uh, an alumnus and faculty mem member, Peter Christoff. The feature documentary today was by two of our MFA social documentary alumni, Taba Joshi and Eric Spink. Uh, so Tashi's Turbine, which is the feature, will play after the two shorts. But first, I'd like to bring up uh, our moderator for today, current MFA social documentary, or SOCDOC, as we like to call it, current SOCDOC student, Anna Montgomery Neutze. Um, and she is going to do a brief interview with the two filmmakers of the shorts, Victoria and Peter. So let's welcome them to the stage. Um, so firstly, can I just ask you to tell us a bit about your time at SVA, so um, what program you were enrolled in and um, what your thesis films were about, if you did a thesis film. Well, uh, since <laughs> I was there first, <laughs> I'll, I'll go first. I was at SVA between 1976 and 1981 in the Fine Arts Department. I took one semester off, so I graduated a little bit late, I took a semester off to study in Florence. And uh, at that time, I was focused only in painting, drawing, and, and printmaking. Uh, film is a new adventure for me. Uh, I did my uh, bachelor's degree in uh, the film department and graduated in 2011. Um, and I shot my thesis short back home in Colombia, which is where I'm from, and it was a narrative short Great, thank you. And can you tell us a little bit about what you've been involved in since you graduated and how that came about? Uh, uh, well, I've continued with my studio practice, uh, but at the same time, I've been teaching at SVA basically since I got out of graduate school. Uh, SVA contacted me shortly after my graduation from Hunter, and, and so I've been teaching painting and drawing at SVA uh, ever since, as well as pursuing my own career in, uh, in fine arts. Um, shortly after graduating school, I started working as a freelance producer, and I worked as a freelance producer doing uh, advertisement and web content for about five years for various companies, production companies. Um, and last year I started a grad program at Columbia University for screenwriting and directing, so that's what I've been up to. Great, and you were telling me a little bit about your graduate program um, in the green room. Could you um, just tell us a little bit more about what that involves for you over the next um, couple of years? The one I'm doing now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the graduate program uh, that I'm involved in now, or that I'm in, it revolves around narrative film. So we're, uh, I'm writing a, my second feature screenplay and um, a TV series and uh, a script, a treatment for a TV series and a script for a pilot episode. And um, I'll be making a short film that is that has something to do with the feature script that, I, that I'm writing this year. And finally, uh, if you could just each tell us a bit about what we're about to see, the films that we're going to watch. Sure, uh, the film that I made is uh, part of a project that I did while I was artist in residence last year at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It uh, involves the documenting of weavers in Aegean Turkey working on rugs that were designed by interns at the museum that were then exhibited at the Met alongside with this short film. Um. My short is called Skull and Bone, and it was shot in New Orleans over Mardi Gras weekend, and it follows a 200-year-old Creole uh, Mardi Gras gang that um, that is from Treme, and um, they, I don't want to give it away, but okay. yeah, <laughs> that's fine. I'll let you guys see. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much, and um, thank you again, everybody, and enjoy the films. Uh, Taba Joshi is a filmmaker and cinematographer who received his MFA in Sakta, at SACDOC here at SVA. He is interested in social and cultural issues, both in the U.S. and abroad. 
Tashi's Turbine was his first feature-length documentary, which aired on PBS's World Channel in 2016. He was awarded the Princess Grace Just Films Grant in 2012, the Shelley and Donald Rubin Foundation Grant in 2013, and the Center for Asian American Media Documentary Fund in 2014. As an emerging voice in independent cinema, he was selected to participate in the 2016 Artist Academy at Lincoln Center, hosted during the New York Film Festival. Taba has worked as a cinematographer for Art 21 and Documentary Films Internationally, and Eric Spink is a producer at Vacant Light, a film and media production company based here in New York. He has worked in the industry over the last decade in film, TV, and digital media. His work is screened at film festivals internationally, and he has served, he served as the co-producer on Tashi's Turbine. Let's welcome these three. So firstly, just congratulations on an amazing and beautiful and touching film. Um, and I just wanted to start by getting a feel for what your time at SVA was like. So if you could tell us about what you, um, what program you were both enrolled in and what um, your thesis films were about, that would be great. Sure. Um, well, first of all, thank you for everyone to, uh, who came out to see the film. Um, so I went to the social documentary program um, at the School of Visual Arts with Eric. Um, and. Uh, I, I came into the program uh, with very little production knowledge and experience in filmmaking. And so for me, this was quite a, an achievement <laughs> um, to go from, you know, just coming in with like still camera kind of experience to actually uh, um, shooting a feature length documentary. And the program really helped in facilitating that um, for me. Um, from just not only just a production standpoint, also story and, and the advisors kind of helping me through that process. Great, thank you. Yeah, so I was in the same program with Taba. Um, we started in 2011 and graduated in 2013. I had come into the program with a background in cinema history and theory. I studied at SUNY Purchase College uh, for my undergrad. Um, but I was really looking for that foundation in actual production. Uh, work and learning how to direct and produce, which I didn't feel like I had learned uh, with my previous work. Um, so when Amitabh started working on uh, on his thesis film, uh, and he gave me the opportunity to come on as producer, I thought it was a, a great opportunity and uh, certainly couldn't turn that down. Um, uh, so after graduation, we formed a production company. Um, called Vacant Light, and the first project that we wanted to put through that production company was this film, Tashi's Turbine. And uh, last year, last fall, it made its premiere on uh, uh, World Channel, which is part of PBS. Great. Well, that actually segues nicely into my next question, which is, um, when you're at film school, you're expected to do everything from directing to you know, all of the production and post-production stuff. So what is it that each of you have decided to specialize in now, and how did you go about making that decision? Um, so as I said earlier, it was a bit of a learning process for me just because I wasn't, I was coming with, with very little experience. And so I was slowly learning through um, the program and doing the different films the first year and second year that I, I really liked uh, uh, filming and shooting things. And so I, my focus at this point has been primarily as a cinematographer. Great, thank you. Um, I had previously before SVA had some experience in recording sound. Uh, so I had that kind of production knowledge and also worked a bit in post-production. Um, but then since SVA, I've really taken a, a much more um, focused concentration on producing. Okay, great. And can you tell us um, what some of the most re um, surprising or rewarding things have been that you've experienced since graduating? Uh, just in general? Or? Yeah, uh, well, related to your career. <laughs> so, wait, so surprising things? So, okay, we'll go with rewarding, and then <laughs> later on I'll get to some of the other, because I think surprising is going to feature later on. Um. I, I would say I, I think it's interesting to work as a documentary filmmaker. It allows you to explore different spaces that you generally wouldn't be in. You know, it could you could be 
doing so many different things and you're allowed to access into worlds that you might have not actually, you know, you might not have friends in that circle or anything like that. So that's, I think, the most kind of rewarding thing for me is getting to meet people that I would never meet at all. Yeah, I, I would absolutely agree with that too. Working in documentary does open these doors and allows you to, with that help of having a camera, kind of enter these worlds that that otherwise, you know, would be kind of um, closed off to you. Um, so it really, really gives that opportunity. Um, what do you think was the most challenging thing about moving from graduate school into the real world of film, <laughs> the real world of filmmaking? Um, uh, a <laughs> lot. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a difficult question. It, it's it's a lot. I mean, the expectations are much higher, um, and there's room no room for error. I mean, thing it, it's just a a whole host of things. <laughs> um, uh, it's it's a, a it's a process to get to a point where you feel comfortable doing what you do. People trust you to do what you do, and and with that comes also, you know, um, payment, you know, paying. Because initially coming out of school, you're not gonna get paid uh, day rates that you would expect to be paid maybe, and understandably so. So I think that it's a, a large learning curve that I think takes time um, for you to gain the experience and for you to, d to develop a network of people that trust you. Yeah, and I, I agree that those are definitely um, some of the first challenges faced when, when leaving the program. Um, I, I think one of the greatest advantages of being at SVA in the social documentary program is it at least gave us kind of this foundation of a network to, to start with. Um, most importantly, actually being each other's uh, classmates. So in our class, there was only 13 of us, but that, thir that group of 13 um, stayed pretty close and we've been able to pull each other onto each other's projects, whether it be, um, uh, our films or the other types of like client work that we do. Um, we've, we do a lot of like branded content, kind of this documentary style um, work for uh, different companies and nonprofits and that type of thing, um, which has been kind of a, a great way for us to kind of break into the industry a little bit and, and continue honing our skills more and more as documentary filmmakers on, on smaller projects. Um, uh, but yeah, it's it's difficult. It's uh, <laughs> documentary filmmaking is not exactly uh, the thing to choose if you want to be a millionaire. <laughs> but um, but but you can certainly have a career with it, and uh, and it's it's rewarding work. It's you're able to, like we said, enter these worlds and then be able to share these stories um, uh, with the rest of the world that wouldn't necessarily have access to um, to these types of stories. Um, Eric, you've spoken a little bit about your the relationship, uh, your working relationship, and I'm just wondering if you could um, elaborate on how important, you're both clearly very close, and how important has that relationship been in terms of your career thus far? Um, so filmmaking is a collaborative uh, medium, and, and it's extremely, you know, it's difficult to do everything, and you're not going to be good at everything <laughs> and so it's extremely helpful to have um, someone there to help you because a lot of these uh, trips uh, I just wouldn't have been able to do it all alone um, I had um, another producer there in Nepal a sound person myself um, so it's something that um, is extremely important um, in filmmaking yeah, uh, when we started collaborating, we actually started collaborating on the first year of the program. The MFA program is two years. Um, so we had started collaborating on the shorter films in that first year, and then, um, of course, worked together on the, on the thesis films. And I think pretty early on, we realized that our skills were kind of complementary. Um, Tabo was taking a focus very much in directing and cinematography, and I was taking a focus very much in uh, producing and editing. Um, however, Tabo did edit the film as well. Um, but that, that kind of working relationship worked well to, um, to start this film and then also to start the other uh, projects that we were doing. But um, yeah, it's good to find someone who uh, has similar skills, but also somebody who has very different skills from you too. And I think that that's what's been able to 
um, kind of help our collaborations uh, be successful. Yeah. Great. And before I move on to questions that are more specific to this film, if you could just briefly touch on some of the other projects that you've been involved in over the last few years since graduation. Um, so primarily they've been uh, documentary, um, you mean just in terms of documentary stuff or um, filmmaking in general? Uh, up to you, okay. yeah, in general. Uh, so I, I've done a number of shorter uh, documentaries all based in Nepal. I did one uh, right after the earthquake. Uh, actually, I did a series of shorter things right after the earthquake in Nepal. Um, and, um, and more uh, New York-based projects that are shorter. I'm still looking for kind of a feature-length documentary thing to follow. Mm -hmm. I haven't found that yet. <laughs> OK, great. Yeah, uh, so one of the other projects we've been working on uh, was actually my thesis film when I was here at SVA, uh, which is still, I, I made a, a short version of it, which was shown for my, for my thesis showcase. Um, uh, but we've continued working on it since then, and that film is about um, the city cemetery for New York City, uh, which is on a place called Hart Island, uh, which is where all of the unclaimed or unidentified people of New York City are buried. Um, so that's our next feature-length documentary, which we are uh, finishing up now and hope to have out by next year. Um, in addition to that, uh, as I mentioned, we also do this type of like client work as well, and I'll just talk about one real quick. Um, about a year after we graduated from SVA, we met up with another SVA graduate who had graduated in the 80s, and uh, he is a photographer named Rick Gudati, um, who was a former fashion photographer after his time at SVA. Um, but he was leaving the fashion world and was looking um, to um, uh, take his skills in fashion photography and bring it to something else. And what he decided to do was uh, bring it to the world of medicine. And his mission since the mid-90s now has been to uh, uh, reshoot the images that are in medical textbooks and replace all of these um, images that are often kind of uh, looking at people as specimens or subjects and to replace those images with uh, images that are much more respectful and showing people uh, with dignity. Um, so in, 2000, in 2013, um, he wanted to bring uh, the work that he's done over the last decade in, or last two decades, in um, uh, still photography and start doing video work. So he came to us and we started originally as interns, but now have turned that project um, into uh, a whole series of these uh, training videos, medical training videos, um, that medical schools are using. Um, to kind of show people with more dignity than what has been done previously. That sounds incredibly interesting. <laughs> so can people see those videos? Yes, uh, that's all on uh, positiveexposure.org. Okay. And so there's uh, about 10 of them now, but there'll be more. Wow. Awesome, okay. Um, so speaking about this film, can you talk about, um, Tabo, I know this started out as your thesis film. Where did the idea come from and why was it so important to you? Uh, sure. Um, so I, I knew from the beginning that I wanted to do something in Nepal. I, uh, it was just, uh, you know, I was born in Nepal, I grew up in the U.S., and so I've always wanted to spend more time in Nepal. And that's kind of initially how it started off. But specifically Mustang, which is the reason, region that Tashi is from and where the turbine is, I was just in love with the landscape from the beginning, and I was looking for stories there initially started with the idea of kind of looking at uh, Chinese encroachment in that region um, uh, because that has been an issue in the past and this has been an access point for Tibetan refugees to exit. And so um, that's how I initially got into looking for stories in Upper Mustang. And then I met Tashi, who's extremely politically involved. He's involved in anything imaginable. So I started talking to him and he's told me, you know, I'm going to build a wind turbine uh, this summer. Do you want to come film me? And I said, oh, this is great. Um, I'm coming. Yeah. And that's really how it began. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. And obviously it's been a number of years since working on it to um, bring it to the state that it's in now. So can you talk about how your initial concept changed? So what you imagined the film would be when you started out versus what it is? has become. Uh, sure, and, and 
anybody who's done any documentary work, I think they quickly realize it never is what you want it to be. And, and, um, and that's the kind of exciting part of it, I think. Because I, so I initially went in with this kind of idea that it'd be about Chinese encroachment, and then it certainly turned into talking, I wanted it to be about uh, youth leaving rural areas in Nepal, because a lot of the youth in Nepal leave to go to work abroad in the Middle East and Malaysia and Korea. And so I wanted to explore what it would mean for villages and uh, um, rural areas in Nepal to not have young men and, and what that would be like. And so I, this film initially started off with uh, two other characters. Um, one was a nomad that I followed for a while and his family would go across the Nepalese-Chinese border um, because they have uh, yaks uh, and they have to just kind of migrate during the winters, they come down, and during the summers, they go back up. And so he was someone that um, we ended up having to remove out of the film uh, just because uh, it's, um, when you have these multiple storylines going on uh, in a film, it, it, you always, you realize they're competing with each other. And the, the story of the nomad and the other story was uh, the story of a librarian uh, she ran a library up in Upper Mustang, and uh, their stories just didn't compete with Tashi. Uh, we felt like Tashi's story was much larger and compelling, and so we decided to just cut those two characters out of the film, even though I had spent a lot of time filming, <laughs> um, which is painful always. But um, uh, yeah, it, it's a it's a difficult thing to do, I, especially because if um, the there are benefits and disadvantages to doing um, uh, kind of the, in some way, all of the work also. I, I mean, I had a lot of support from Eric and uh, the rest of the crew, but um, I edited this myself. And I, I feel like uh, if you're shooting it, directing it, and editing it yourself, you, you become, you're very close to the material and you, you have a hard time kind of distancing yourself and figuring those things out. Um, um, I don't know where I was going with that, but uh, it's, so I forgot what the question was. It was just about how the story changed. Right, <clears throat> no, I, that's, that's how the story changed, yeah. It was originally three other people and we just cut it down to one person. Okay, great, thank you. Can you, yeah, okay. Can you talk um, a bit about some of the complications that you encountered while you were making the film? Uh, oh, yeah, there was like everything imaginable. Um, I'll give you the the most dramatic one, I guess. When I was the first trip, I flew out to uh, uh, to go shoot. Um, it's it's quite a journey to go from Kathmandu itself to Upper Mustang. You have to take a flight to Pohra, and from Pohra you have to take a flight to Jomsom, and Jomsom is kind of the first. Uh, um, entry point into Mustang as a region. Um, and then after that, it's several days of travel between car and walking and everything else. Now there's a road, which makes it a lot easier. But at that time, it wasn't there yet. Um, but I arrived to Jomsom, and Tashi was, I was supposed to meet Tashi the next day. I had arrived a day earlier, and we were waiting for his flight to come in. And it's really dangerous to fly planes into Jomsom because of the, there's just mountains on both sides, and it's really windy. And so as we're, wait, we're waiting for him to arrive, and suddenly um, this plane just flies into the side of the cliff. And, um, and I, I, I had thought Tashi had died on that flight. Um, and he was, he, that was the flight he was on. And so, but then I suddenly, minutes later, I got a call from Tashi's uh, number. And I was like, oh my god, this is, this is uh, a miracle that, you know, he's still okay. And what had happened was that he actually got pushed off that flight. Um, and, you know, uh, he wasn't on that flight, thank God. Um, but a lot of people, unfortunately, died. And it's, it's a very dangerous region to be flying planes in. Mm -hmm. So one of, the <laughs> one of the many problems that occurred during the production. Wow. Okay. Thank Eric, did you want to add anything? Uh, I'll, I'll just say that uh, one of the greatest challenges was shooting 
with digital cameras that obviously require power in a region with no electricity. Uh, so <laughs> that in itself uh, brought along a challenge. Um, so we had to bring extra batteries. We had to bring extra everything, really, because if something broke, it was a seven-day journey just to get back to the main city in Kathmandu. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and even there, you know, production equipment is rather limited. So we had to go into Nepal with with quite a bit of equipment, and then uh, eventually, once the the turbine was running, we were able to power off of the turbine itself um, to charge the batteries. So we were the turbine's uh, first customers, but. Uh, <laughs> But uh, it it was a, it was a challenge. Yeah. Also shooting in the dark, in the wind, carrying all of your gear. I, I mean, it, it, just, it doesn't yeah. really look like it here, but it's very cold. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you could tell that it's windy, but it looks so sunny and warm. It is very sunny, but because you're about fifteen thousand feet altitude, mm -hmm. um, but uh, but it's it's cold. Yeah. I just think it's it's an, it's an amazing it's amazing. Um, what you guys have been through to create such a beautiful film. Um, was there ever a point during the production that you considered giving up? And if so, how did you push past that and just keep going? Um, you can pass, if you like. <laughs> no, I mean, there were definitely... I would say more so on the post end of things, for me at least. Um, I, I just... I'm, I'm not a good editor. And that's, I, th I think... I quickly realized that that's the benefit. That's what, what I was trying to make the point on, is like actually doing it once, mm -hmm. you quickly, a, as a DP, it's so beneficial to actually sit there and like edit your own work because you realize, oh, look, I totally screwed up here. And, um, <laughs> but it also gives you the opportunity to quickly understand that like, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not going to ever try to attempt to, to ad edit a feature length documentary ever in my life, <laughs> ever. <laughs> um, so that's kind of the benefit of that. Um, in terms of the production, there were moments where I felt like, oh, I can't do this, but I was already there. I wasn't going to, like, abandon and, like, leave. Um, Give up, yeah. Mm. Okay. Eric, you were, you were just solid the whole way. Yeah, I, I, yeah. <laughs> Part of my role, I think, was to be the cheerleader and say, don't give up. So. Okay, great. Okay. So, so, Anna, we're going to open it up to questions from okay, the audience. We great, have about yeah. time for two or three questions. And we will walk the mic since it's a smaller house. Okay. Anyone, there's a mic on that side, too. Anyone? Anyone? Or we can throw it back to Anna. Right behind you. Um, so you said you, because the process make you close to your um, material. Can you talk about um, how is the village doing now? Now there's a turbine. Sure. Um, so the, unfortunately, the turbine hasn't been functional for a while now. Um, as a result of what? Well, it was, it was functional for the first two years afterwards. Yeah. Um, but then it, there was a, a, a really uh, um, difficult winter they had to go through. And the turbine just didn't survive. The, the blades came off. And they had to take it down just because of safety reasons. They felt like it was going to tip over. It, it's a very harsh climate during the winters. And, and so I think Tashi and the team have to kind of reconsider the materials they're going to use for uh, reinstalling it. Uh, yeah. Hi. Um, what uh, percentage of Nepal uh, does not have electricity, uh, both in that region and in Nepal in general? Um, and and also uh, Tashi, what made him want to, you know, bring? I mean, obviously it's <laughs> it's a great thing for him to have done. But what is his background, and why did he specifically choose that area and and do that project? Um, sure, I, I can't give you an exact figure of what percentage of Nepal is electrified. It, what I can tell you is that. Um, in Upper Mustang, even to today, there isn't a consistent electrical, like they're not connected to the national grid. Um, and so the, Nepal is just a very difficult terrain to try to electrify. Uh, just because of the mountain ranges, it, it's, it's a challenge, it's an engineering challenge. Um, so uh, what these rural areas really rely on um, 
in that region is microhydropower um, because they do have rivers. Um, so, but they're not, a, they're not functional year round because they freeze over during the winters. Um, so it's challenging. There's multiple challenges to it. Um, sorry, what was your second question? Well, why did Tashi? So Tashi is uh, Tashi is interesting because he um, he um, he quickly I think realized he needed to leave that region. He came to Kathmandu. He learned English. Uh, you know, he he developed skills that I think helped him do this type of work to kind of help his community. Um, I think he understood that there needs to be a grassroots level kind of initiative that needs to take place in the, these rural areas because the government's never gonna come in and help them because it's just such, uh, such a low priority for them to try to help these rural regions. And so I think he feels like it, he needs to be an advocate for his region and um, which, is, uh, which is unique in Nepal, I, I think. And that's the reason that I kind of followed Tashi was that he's someone that's really passionate about a lot of different things, and um, and it's amazing that he was able to do that on all on his own. We have time for one more question. Um, I was just curious because some of the um, people were talking about very personal things, and how how was it for you to like build this trust and connection with the community and people from the village, and you know. Uh, sure. So I, I spent, um, I spent quite a bit of. I mean, I didn't get to spend as much time as I wanted uh, in the region. But I, each trip I did, I spent about a month, um, and so I, I got to know um, a lot of people in that village um, just because Tashi was kind of. Um, it required Tashi to kind of win over the village, and they get, became part of the whole initiative, as you saw in the, the raising, they were part of it. Um, and so it also gave me an opportunity to kind of cast who are the interesting people that I would like to meet and speak to. Um, I had a language barrier because I don't speak uh, Loa, um, but uh, it also afforded, uh, Tashi just afforded me a lot of kind of trust between them, because they felt like I was I was very much, you know, I was there with Tashi every day, and so they just assume that I'm part of Tashi's, the, the turbine project also. And so I think that kind of afforded me access in different ways. I want to thank Taba and Eric and Anna so much. Thank you all for coming. Let's give them a round of applause. Uh, they'll probably come out to the lobby if you want to say hello afterwards.